Uh, thanks very much, Stathis. I'm afraid that Paul Mason has to go, so thanks to him and, uh, and his apologies to the uh, discussion, which he won't be able to take part in. Now, we're now going to open up for questions, debate, contributions. Uh, the idea will be to take several at a time. Because of the less than cutting edge gender balance, uh, I'll be going for, uh, uh, where possible, for women voices and uh, contributions uh, first and give uh, primacy to them. Uh, but, uh, sorry, you want to raise something straight away? No. Okay, so we're, we're going to take questions in a group, um, as I said, and uh, on any part of the dis discussion and debate. So we need to, you to talk into the microphone for the recording. Um, so before you make your, raise your question or make your contribution, please wait for the two people with the microphones to come to you. So um, could I have a show of people who want to contribute um, or, or ask questions straight away? I'm falling down on my gender aspiration. Um, OK, so we've got uh, someone here at the front. Um, uh, ah. Up, up there uh, as, as a second. So if we could start here and then move over to the back there. Where's the second microphone? And another one over there. So where's the second microphone? So the, yeah, okay, thanks very much. Uh, my name's Chris Knight. I've been heavily involved <coughs> since October the 15th <coughs> with the Occupy movement, particularly Occupy London. Um, <coughs> I'm, I, I get the feeling that the recommend, recommendations from the, from the, 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 the platform, um, uh, in so many different ways, kind of imply we've got to rely on this, that, or the other parliamentary forces, politicians. And I, I, I'm just saying, what's, what's, what's wrong with the idea that a lot of us are beginning to come to, which is so much simpler? We, our slogan in Occupy London is all power to the, 98, to the 99%. That's the, that's the agenda. And then, and then another slogan suggests the mechanism. And it's extremely simple. Occupy everything, everywhere. <laughs> and I would, I would suggest that, that rather than ask lots of intellectuals to give us... I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in all this. I think, I think you know, it's, it's, it's very important to understand stuff. But, but essentially, we've got to boil it all down to something simple. And what's the objection to what we're doing now around the world? Just get hold of everything. Get hold of every building, any factory that's been closed, any bank, just occupy the thing, reclaim it, right around the world. It has the advantage, doesn't it, of simplicity. Thanks very much. Uh, there, there was somebody here who... Oh, yeah, there. Yes, um, I wasn't going to ask a question, but since you said women can... Uh, it's a question for, um, I think, Costas. Uh, you mentioned um, this... The wartime, if there was a default in Greece, that there would be kind of wartime measures. My question was about um, the situation in particular of agriculture. Um, we know that Europe has been subsidizing the periphery to not be agriculturally productive anymore. And it seems to me that um, it's more successful, you can have a more successful default and a more successful independent industrial economy if you have agriculture. I think not having food production under your control would be severely difficult if you devalue the currency, so that's my question. If you devalue the currency? Well, if you turn into drachmas and you don't produce your own agriculture and you have to import food. Okay, thanks very much. Um, there was uh, somebody over here. Thank you. Really interesting discussion, really timely, thank you. Uh, it's interesting with all this news from Brussels that it seems everyone's forgotten what's happening down in Durban with the uh, COP of the climate negotiations. Um, so one of the things that environmentalists have been saying for a very long time, not just environmentalists as well, is that uh, growth, GDP growth, is not the only measure of benefit. So if we now have this situation where it looks like we're not going to be getting a lot of growth anyway, plus we need to be starting to revamp the way that we organise ourselves in order to, well, one, cope with the climate change that's probably already happening, and two, look after the resources, the biodiversity, etc., that we have to um, sustain that and maintain diversity and maintain the cultural diversity and the grassroots level work and organisation that we need to just be resilient to survive in a good way through this time on an ecological level, which in the end 
does come before all this economic stuff. So I'm just wondering, you know, if you have any ideas there about how we can bring together these two discourses, which many people do bring together, but here have so far been kind of kept a little bit apart. Thanks Thank very you. much. We've got a, a, a question or a contribution right down here at the front. If uh, we could bring the microphone down here. Thanks. Yeah, hello, my name is Paolo Chiocchetti. I just had a general question to the panel. <coughs> there is somehow an idea uh, from the different contribution that there is uh, a kind of Keynesian way out of the general crisis, either with uh, more deficit spending or with devaluation and then uh, the reconnection of the industrial base of the country. Uh, I wanted to ask if, if it's really so. I agree very much with the conclusion of the reports, but I'm a little bit puzzled by the idea that uh, we can get a s simply a way out of the crisis by deficit spending because, first of all, that was what was done in 2007, 2008, and that produced the sovereign debts. So I'm not sure if it can be done afterwards. And secondly, because like during the um, Great Depression, the way out of the crisis came only after a uh, uh, massive destruction of the fixed issues and the real capital you know, and the destruction of, uh, completed destruction of means of production in Europe. So that, that was my question. Thanks, Paolo. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, just, just one point and, and two questions. Uh, George, you m mentioned, uh, spoke about the, the potentiality for the rise of xenophobic fascistic forces in Europe as they did in the 1930s. And I think it would be like-minded in the extreme to rule out that possibility on a large scale. At the same time, I think Stathis is right, that this threat of nationalism, of xenophobia, of anti-minority uh, prejudice and so on, is not in the future and coming simply from the far right, but is built into the crisis ideology of the European elites and of the European states now. I mean, when you read in the uh, best-selling Austrian paper, which is not a Eurosceptic paper, it's a paper which is for preserving the Eurozone. Griechen raus, Greeks out, not even Griechenland raus, not even Greece out, but Greeks out. You know, you just think of one syllable difference from what it, uh, what it connotes, plus all the anti-migrant labour measures which are taking place and so on. And I think that's important because the kind of approach which uh, Kostas and Statis and others are arguing for is often characterised, certainly in that UBS report, as opening the door to uh, national chauvinism and so on. The national chauvinism is, is upon us, and it's upon us from the very people who were meeting in Brussels yesterday and, uh, yesterday and this morning, despite all the protestations of a uh, greater, deeper Europe and so on. So that's the observation. Two questions. One, I also don't have faith in François Hollande or in the uh, SPD to return even to the days of Andreas Papandreou, let alone to something which is more radical. Do you think that is primarily because of the ideological buy-in to 30 years of, of neoliberalism, the idea that there is no alternative and so on? How much of it is that? And how much of it do you think is structured into the very nature of the contemporary crisis and the way in which it's refracted through the, uh, through the mechanisms of the Eurozone and the European Union. In other words, that there isn't really the wiggle room for that. And associated, I'd like uh, all the panel to say more about what they think are the social and political forces that can be, not sucked out of anyone's thumb, but potentially can start to impose this kind of, uh, this kind of solution, given the fact that at the elite level and amongst the political classes, in Europe, it's not something that they want to turn to. How is it that we can impact on the political situation in order to have meaning political effect? Thanks very much. I'm going to take one more contribution, then we're going to ha have a comeback by the panel and then back to the contributions down here on the right. When we're thinking about solutions, we need to be clear about what the solutions are. The, the Euro, the, the ECB have plenty of money. In fact, the Fed could possibly bail out the Eurozone. They've got $3 trillion stashed in various accounts. They've bought $50 billion worth of uh, uh, European debt just the other day. There's no shortage of money, but there's a political imperative to reduce the, the, the working conditions of the workers outside of Germany. And therefore, in that sense, there is no alternative for the ECB. And therefore, when we're looking 
at what are the alternatives, I think we've got to be clear. I think I largely agree with Costas's analysis. But if you're saying that you're going to seriously break with the Eurozone, break with the ECB, break with the Euro, if you're going to wipe out all of debt owed to those banks, um, to the ECB, to those governments, you're going to have to break with capitalism. That is an anti-capitalist, socialist, revolutionary agenda. And I think we have to be quite explicit about that. This is really, you hear it often on the left, there is no alternative, blah, 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 all the rest of it. We've been around a long time, we've all heard those stories. But when you look at Greece, you can honestly say there is no capitalist alternative that is going to solve the Greek problem, if you want to put it like that, in the interests of the workers. Um, and even UBS, uh, I mean, okay, it's exaggerated, blah, blah, but if you read their report, it's quite clear. It says there's never been the breakup of a fiscal union without civil war, quote, from UBS. So the capitalists are quite clear what it involves, and I think... From our point of view, as socialists, if we're going to be serious about the alternative, we also need to be clear about what it involves. It involves a socialist, anti-capitalist alternative. Thanks very much. Uh, so we've got a very wide range of contributions covering uh, agriculture, occupation, climate, uh, Keynesian deficit spending, xenophobia, uh, ideology, and whether there is a solution to any of this within capitalism. And each of the three panel members have got two minutes each. Uh, so, um, Costa, since you started off so magnificently, maybe you could, challenge, you could take, you know, deal with all that in two minutes. Yeah, I've lost the challenge. Um, agriculture is a very important thing here because it is an, a pressing issue in Greece. Uh, the policies that have been applied to the country uh, the last two decades have been disastrous. Greece used to have f food self-sufficiency. It doesn't now. It imports huge amounts of food. You, know, you might say, is this a bad thing necessarily? Well, it, is a, it is a bad thing now. We now know it's a bad thing. And you know, reliance abroad for food isn't necessarily a good thing. This country might discover it uh, in the coming years, because Britain is also dependent on uh, huge food uh, imports. So how do you deal with it? Um, there has to be um, a rebirth of agriculture, and I think exit is necessary for that. Exit is necessary for this. Uh, it would allow Greek uh, agriculture to come back to life, and it would allow actually food production perhaps to become cheaper. Food is actually very expensive in Greece. It's a, it's a very expensive thing. Uh, it's, on a, it's one of the peculiar things of entering the euro. It hasn't been cheaper. The imports have not actually worked out in relative prices. Quite why that is, is a difficult question of political economy, but it definitely is expensive. And it's actually more expensive than Britain in even absolute terms, never mind relative terms. And if you put it in relative terms, it's phenomenal. So uh, exit is important for agriculture to, in a sense, recover, revive, and cheapen food uh, production to improve the conditions of working people um, in a domestic context. I think that would be a benefit of exit, not, not a problem. Green growth is also very important, that probably more important elsewhere than in other countries of Europe than Greece. It's, a, it's obviously a path of development, it's obviously a path of jobs, it's obviously a path in which uh, it appears mature Western economies have got a comparative advantage, but this would require uh, the right alliance of social forces to make it come about. You know, do something about houses, you know, improve the green properties, do something about production of clean energy, and so on. This requires a different alliance, and that is a growth uh, uh, area in which a transform society could give to which you could transform society could give far greater emphasis than uh, private capitalist interests could ever do. Uh, I would argue. Now these are the uh, more practical questions. Now let me come to the ECB. Just say say one thing about the ECB. Theory says that the central bank does what it does because it relies on a state. The central bank has got fiat. It issues its own money, and this money is accepted. Uh, generally, not because it's a disembodied power in midair, but because it relies on a state. The power of, Bern of, of Bernanke comes from Obama. It doesn't come from, from Bernanke himself. Right? The power of, uh, of uh, you know, Mervyn King comes from uh, Cameron. That's where it comes from, ultimately. The, in other words, the tax collecting powers of the, of, the, of, the, of the state are ultimately the backup for the capacity of the central bank to issue fiat money. Right? We take the state away, the central bank cannot do that. Now, the ECB has been a bit of a juggling act all this time, because there is no state that can do that. It's an alliance of states behind it. 
it's got problems. When you ask it to, to replicate what Bernanke is doing, you come against the structural differences between the ECB and the uh, and central bank like the Federal Reserve, which has a singular, uh, a, a, a federal state, or like uh, the British Central Bank, which has a, a unitary state behind it. And that's not an easy thing to resolve because the states that back up the ECB have got their own differences. You know, it's not this, they're not allies, they, they fight it out. So that has to be factored in. It's no use asking the ECB to do what other central banks do uh, and think that he can technically and easily solve it because he can't. There's a political economy in which we've seen it being played out all the time. If it was so easy, why is it that Draghi doesn't see it? You know, if it's so easy, why isn't that Trisha doesn't see it? Are they stupid? No, no. Right? There, are, there are interests behind which are very, very important, which we've got to factor in, we've got to analyze. I, I can't say any more. Now, I'll probably run out of my two minutes. You have, of course. But just, <laughs> just, just, um, just one thing on, I can't, I'll come back to social democracy possibly uh, afterwards, but one thing I want to say about the alternative. Yes, we are arguing about an anti-capitalist alternative here. We should be clear about it. The issue for those who wish to propose different things, alternative things in Europe at the moment, the way I see it is as follows. We've got to put across ideas that solve the crisis. That must be paramount. They solve it in the here and now. Not in three months or three years or a decade from now. In the here and now. People want the solution now in the way in which the crisis affects them. Right? And it affects them very differently in Germany to what it does in Greece. So we must propose solutions that work in the here and now. But these must be part and parcel of a broader program that actually transforms and changes society and economy and makes for growth, makes for jobs, makes for greater equality. It's actually, in my understanding of it, an anti-capitalist way of doing things. It's actually a way of, uh, of reversing neoliberalism, re reversing all the trends that we've observed the last uh, 10, 20 years. That's what's at issue. That's what really is in front of us. And the, the sooner we start thinking uh, about it in those terms, uh, the better for all of us. Thanks, Mr. George. I don't know. I could give a very short answer and say, the gentleman over there is absolutely right. Socialism is the answer. Full stop. The problem is that... <laughs> yes, now. So the crusty old socialist. I believe that. And I've been standing up for socialism and democratic socialism as opposed to social democracy for many years. Nevertheless... One of the things I have to recognize is that so-called actually existing socialism as we knew it in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union is dead and buried. And so are many of the institutions which helped sustain a socialist or even a social democratic tradition. Primarily, trade unions. When I was young, I used to go on marches, and I, I mean, there were trade union summer schools, and there were socialist summer schools, and whatever. All of that seems to be gone. Now, forget about my youth. Let's just come back to the here and now, which we were talking about. Some of the people I stay in touch with quite closely over the European question are the people, the European TUC people in Brussels, uh, and the sort of arguments which I put about looking at the neoliberal underpinnings of the euro as we have it at present and working on a long-term strategy to change that are the sorts of arguments which appeal to them. And Costas, your work will certainly fit in with that, that view. Unless you've given up totally on existing trade unions, unless you've given up totally on political parties or whatever. And here I just want to come back very quickly to a point uh, someone else made about the 99%. Yes, yes, occupy London, occupy everywhere, if possible. <laughs> the person who argued most eloquently for extra parliamentary politics ironically, was Ralph Miliband, father of young Ed. What have we got now? 
people sitting in, you know, at appearing at parliamentary question time, doing a little song and dance act, which is largely irrelevant to the questions of the day. Uh, I'm deeply disturbed, as I think most of you are. Nevertheless, we've not got any easy answers. We've not got any ready solutions, and we have to keep plugging away, defending certain interests on the left, and trying to build the institutions that keep the left movement going. That's all I can say. Thanks, thanks, George. Of course, there are still trade union summer schools. Um, so, yeah. Staffers, would you um, give your two minutes in response to the six questions and the 45 points raised? Yeah. Right, okay. So, um, one thing about agriculture, uh, which in Greece is absolutely obvious, I mean, the European Union has paid, uh, has destroyed agriculture, actually, and has paid people for not to produce, actually. So, it had a deeply corrupting effect in societies by, on the one hand, I mean, conducting a kind of violent capitalist concentration of agriculture, and on the other hand, by softening this uh, capitalist modernization by uh, making somehow former farmers or agriculturists into transforming them into social parasites, into people uh, uh, just expecting, you know, to receive their cash from uh, the European Union. I mean, this, this deeply corrupting and corroding effect of uh, the European Union, especially in, in, in Greek society, hasn't been commented uh, upon. Uh, they are, you know, in order to be corrupted, you have someone to, you need someone to corrupt you. And the European Union has been a much more powerful corrupter, I think, than most actually Greek uh, politicians. Now, uh, the discussion about, you know, um, Keynesianism, uh, um, socialism and, and so on. This is, uh, there are two ways of, of putting things. The first is, you know, to, to say what, what is specifically Keynesian in the agenda uh, Costas and other people are putting forward. Uh, there are some elements which could somehow bear a, a family uh, resemblance with uh, Keynesianism. For instance, the idea that, you know, state intervention is needed uh, in order somehow to reconstruct a productive infrastructure in countries which have been, you know, deeply damaged by those, the dynamics of the polarized development uh, I've been talking about uh, before. Okay, but this is not, this is integrated into a framework of changing social relations, of changing the social balance of, of forces, and first and foremost, it is integrated into a framework which poses in a very concrete way the terrain of the confrontation with the strategy of the adversary. And for me, this is the essential point. I'm totally, I mean, if we, if we are to be serious about socialist politics, I think that we should abandon this narcissistic radicalism of much of uh, the discourse on the left. I mean, I'm personally, I'm really absolutely fed up by uh, the type of discourses saying that, you know, I am more radical than you, socialism is the solution, and so on and so forth. Because the point with this, uh, with all those things, is not that they are, in a way, intrinsically wrong, is that they are intrinsically abstract, and therefore irrelevant. Uh, to put it differently, socialist revolutions didn't happen uh, to realize immediate socialist aims. When one looks at the immediate, the, the real aims of the big revolutionary upheavals in history, let's take the Russian Revolution, for instance, we are astonished many times by how modest the objectives of the revolutionaries were. I mean, it was about, I mean, the Russian Revolution was about immediate peace. It was about land. It was about workers' control, which, as Lenin emphasized, didn't mean at all socialization of, the, of, of production. This is something that came much later in the course of the civil war because the capitalists had shut down all the factories and so on and so forth. So this upheaval didn't start with presumably, you know, these abstract radical slogans you find in brochures or in books. It started as an immediate answer to 
the terrain where you know, the class struggle and the divide between opposing forces was happening. And this is what we have in a way to reinvent now. Where is the demarcation line? For me, Costas and his, and, and, and his work are tremendously important because they show this is where it is happening. This is the demarcation line now. This is where the confrontation, the real confrontation happens. There is much, you know, the, one of the reasons there is so much confusion on the left in Europe today is that because it's absolutely fine to talk about socialism, etc. I can say that the, the, the Greek left, I mean, the majority of the Greek radical left is absolutely fine talking about class struggle, about socialism, anti-capitalism, and so on. But a large part of those same people say, exiting the euro, oh, no, 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 that's really, that's really not, not possible. I mean, starting a confrontation with the European Union, but this is pure madness. I mean, how can you say this, this type of things? Even, I mean, much more seriously, the French radical left, I mean, is totally unclear about such a fundamental point such as the legitimacy of the debt. I, I, I read all the programs of, you know, the, 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 the main candidate of the radical left, Mélenchon and his left front, which is, you know, an umbrella with the Communist Party and other uh, forces of, of, of the radical left in it. And they, they have no clear position about the sheer legitimacy of, of, of the debt. So this is, I think, where concretely speaking, you know, socialist politics is at stake today. And that's what we have to work on, on an agenda on a transition program which is adapted to uh, the requirements of the current situation, actually, and which opens up really a possibility of a concrete break with the current logic. How far this break will go, this depends really on the level of, of the class struggle. But what is politically urgent and analytically urgent for us to think is where it happens, to see the points, to see where, you know, the knots, actually, of, of, of the whole problem. Thanks, David. <laughs> okay, we'll take another batch of questions. We've got one up here at the top. Hello. Uh, my name is Jaya Brecky. Um, I'm not a socialist, so I don't have a problem with narcissistic radicalism, hopefully. Um, I'm curious, though, about the... And I haven't read... The, the RMF report yet, so I can't say, I can't talk with uh, uh, that much about um, uh, or, or response to that, but I am curious about uh, the general comments tonight that seems to be placing mainly a focus on, um, uh, well, kind of the causes and solutions of the crisis being solely within the EU, and also that there seems to be a focus on the welfare state as the kind of limit of imagination for any alternative. Um, yeah, I mean, exiting the euro in order to re-establish a, a strong re redistributive state, state in order to create a competitive country where you'll essentially have uneven and diverging com competition on a global rather than EU scale does not sound exactly anti-capitalist to me. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, just looking on this gender question, now we're failing. Okay, up, up there. Thanks. Um, yeah, just picking up on, on what Satis said, which is, is the, what he described as narcissistic radicalism. Because one of the things I do think is uh, important about the work we've done with the RMF is that it is absolutely necessary in the crisis to get beyond the point of saying there is a crisis of capitalism, therefore you need socialism, and just making a grand declaration about it and getting down to the brass tacks of what are the steps that are necessary now to address the questions that people are actually confronted with. And the most obvious one, anywhere inside the EU, anywhere really inside the developed world where this is being applied, is precisely on the question of austerity, which means in the first instance presenting a case for actually the defence of the welfare state as it exists, and allied to that, I think, also a defence of democracy as it exists. And yes, of course, you want to then say, well, actually, we can do this better. There is... Uh, there are other things we can do, there are other steps we can take, but these two things are absolutely central. It seems to me absolutely critical at the moment that the big historic gains of the labour movements in Europe since the end of the Second World War, which are a kind of form of parliamentary democracy and a form of the welfare state, are in serious danger of being undermined and lost and torn up and torn to shreds. And if we have a left 
that sits there and says, well, you know, this is a big crisis. Hey, let's talk about anti-capitalism. Let's go and talk about something else entirely. Let's not address the specific questions that we're now being confronted with. Then we will fail. And there's no reason to suppose that even in the midst of what I'm quite certain is going to be a worsening and developing crisis, that it is going to get a lot worse before it gets better for anybody out of this. That if we're in the middle of this thing, simply washing our hands and making rather crude, abstract propaganda about it, then we're not going to get anywhere. So what's absolutely critical about the RMF reports, at least in my reading of it, and you know, I confess to having some input into the thing uh, in a rather small sense, and it's one of the tables used earlier, but <laughs> that in the midst of this thing, we have to say, what are the steps? What is the mechanism? What are the movements? What are the social forces we talk to? How do we get out of this? What are the practical things we do? And that shows us a strategy from where we are now, rather than just a declaration of where we'd like to be. Thanks very much. We've got someone in the back row. Uh... Thank you for the opportunities created by gender discrimination. Um, there's a, a flicker of a feeling across some journalists' maps, I think Larry Elliott said this on one occasion, that behind the Eurozone crisis is basically a tax strike by the very rich and I'd like to dwell on that for a moment and ask the panel what they think of the notion of a once-off levy or a continued wealth tax. Um, various commentators have suggested recently that uh, a 2% wealth tax would wipe out, for example, the British deficit in a relatively short space of time. Uh, if it was levied on uh, the richest ex-people in Britain, I think X was a thousand. Um, another suggestion has been a sort of emergency levy of 20% of the asset holdings of an equivalent sort of slice of the wealthiest people um, in the country. And if that sort of solution was applied Europe wide, um, it would perhaps be a correction of this tax strike effect, which of course also extends to. Uh, big companies, as we've seen in the rows about Vodafone and so forth. Um, I'd just like to know what the panel think about that. Thank you. Thanks. We've got someone quite close by. Hi. Yes. Um, I think George is right to point to some of the problems we have on the left, but I think he's overly pessimistic when he says that we don't have trade union marches uh, anymore. We've just had a week ago the largest strike in Britain since 1926, uh, and I personally was on a 20,000 strong protest in Manchester, uh, mainly formed of uh, trade unionists. And if you look across Europe, there's quite serious resistance. In Greece, there was a general strike last week, uh, a general, very large general strike in Portugal the week before that. And worker struggles and resistance has formed part of the backdrop to what's going on. So much so that Sarkozy, although I'm sure he's exaggerating, does say if we don't get it right at this summit, we will face an uprising by the people. I think there's an element of truth to that. That's one of the things that they have to factor in now in the discussions is the resistance they face. The second thing I wanted to say is that I think there is a bit of a danger of a fal false counterposition um, from some people in what staff has said and what other people have said. You see, on the one hand, it's absolutely clear that the left has to provide practical leadership. The great strength of what Costa says is it's absolutely clear to me, if you look at what's happening in the negotiations today, they're talking about entrenching and enshrining the right to do to Europe what they've done to Italy and Greece. That we have to be absolutely against this and have no illusions in Europeanism and all the rest of it. We have to fight very hard and give practical solutions. However, that doesn't mean that we're not interested in talking about socialism and I want to defend a little bit narcissism on the left as well. It's absolutely true that the Russian Revolution was fought over peace, bread and land, but the fact that there were thousands of people prepared to, to advance those slogans required there to be a level of uh, a, a group of people who want a revolution in socialist politics. And at the moment, alongside developing resistance, there's clearly a large minority of people who are questioning capitalism. I don't think we should be sh ashamed of saying that capitalism is part of the problem and beginning to talk about what a socialist solution to, to the crisis of capitalism would look like as well. Great. Uh, someone down here? Thanks. Um, I would also like to kind of follow on from the last person who spoke to say that I'm finding this distinction between 
um, supposedly uh, practical in the here and now and non-practical to be delayed for the future quite problematic. And for me, it's fundamentally important that one of those practical in the here and now questions is how do we organise, how do we relate to each other, how do we socialise, what does that mean? And I don't think it's narcissistic to address that because if we are talking about what's close to a, a wartime economy with an incredibly strong state, then those questions have got to be continuously addressed in the way that we try to do that because otherwise there's a very kind of potentially scary future in such a strong state too. Thanks. We've got a couple of people down here. If we could bring a microphone down here. Thanks. Okay. A couple of historical quotes. David Ricardo said the big, words to the effect, the big restraint on government is fear of the people. The other one is what the Duke of Wellington, one of our finest soldiers, said on viewing some recruits to the British Army in Spain. He said, I don't know what they do to the enemy, but by God, they frighten me. Well, looking round this room this evening and listening to what's being said, I don't think the British ruling class is going to be afraid of you at all. <laughs> You're very good at talking, but when it comes to actually getting down to some concrete action, you're very weak. And that is one of the problems with the left. And that's why I'm proud to say I'm not part of the left. <laughs> Lenin put forward three slogans. It's been correctly pointed out. Peace, bread, land. Well, what we've done in Lewisham is put forward a three-word slogan. People before profits. We're not a socialist group. We've got left-wing people in us, but thank goodness they don't dominate. Otherwise, we'd never get anything done. <laughs> We've contested council elections. We've written a manifesto on which we all agree by consensus. And do you know the words capitalism, the words socialism, and the word democracy don't appear in it once? And we've, we've contested elections and done quite well. In one ward in a by-election, we actually pushed the Tories into last place. We got 8%. The Tories, who previously got 10% in that ward, only got 5 So we can take votes from right across the political spectrum. <coughs> and what we've done just recently, we're a South London group, but we're not afraid to venture north of the river. <laughs> And we've moved into Heston, um, Felt Feltham and Heston in West London. And I had the privilege of being parachuted into the constituency. I'm the first candidate to be parachuted into a constituency without the benefit of a parachute. Um, we've got no organisation there. Um, I don't know how we're going to do. Um, we managed very quickly to get a, uh, a leaflet out. We're pushing out another one uh, t uh, tomorrow. I think we need to bring the Lewisham points to an end. <laughs> right, OK. What I'm, what I'm saying is we are setting up a movement. We go out and talk to ordinary people about issues that affect them. We have policies. We have a, me uh, a website. OK, I think, I think we've got that, yeah. People before Sorry. profit. Lovely, thanks very much. Now, we're going to just, I think, just take a couple more, especially if anyone is, wants to make a point that hasn't been made in, in any similar form before, um, honestly. Um, <laughs> OK, so I'll take one down here and one other with a genuinely new point. <laughs> So, OK, well, we'll have to just pick it at random. Yeah, it's just on the issue of Europe. I mean, uh, as far as I know, it's been attempted to be united before under Hitler. OK, and uh, that was a sort of military attempt. It didn't actually work out. This time round, <laughs> it's been attempted to be united, uh, again, under a political attempt. So the issue is that they're trying to create the United States of Europe. But if we go back in time, Lenin did actually argue that the United States of Europe would either be unrealizable or it would be reactionary. I think we are living through 
the reactionary phase of Europe. Now, the, the question to the panel is, is that America's role in all of this seems to not actually appear. I mean, the two characters installed in Greece and Italy belong to the Trilateral Commission. They are both Bilderbergers, and uh, we have got a crisis of the dollar. In other words, since the Lehman's crash... Uh, Can you wind up, because we okay, are a bit short of time. Yeah, yeah. America's been frightened that big investors would leave go into the euro, so therefore we have a lot of instability within the euro. Fantastic, thanks. Okay, one last uh, question. Uh, over there. Hello. Uh, yeah, Peter Logan. Uh, I don't represent anybody but me. Um, a couple of years ago or so, uh, Wilkinson and Pickett's book, The Spirit Level, had this sentence in it. Something like this. Uh, it said that nowhere is there a popular vision of how to do to create something to the benefit of the vast majority. Now, in in the past, in the recent past, this word vision has popped up loads of times. I've been aware, uh, and this is what, to my mind, is lacking. We do not have a vision. And the problem with visions, uh, uh, which has been sort of partly articulated from, from the table, is that you cannot translate a vision into policies. This is why politicians uh, are unable to have vision, because uh, uh, they have to deal with the everyday. Vision is a long-term thing. But um, we do need our dreams. I mean, after, after all, when, when Martin Luther King made his uh, speech about the dream, it, it wasn't, you know, what are we going to do about that? It was to, to uh, the, the whole point of that is that many people will then share that dream. That is to bring people together in the, sh in the same dream. Now, I have uh, uh, all sorts of problems, but I mean, just one thing I want to say here is that um, there's been a fair amount of talk about job creation. This is obviously a problem uh, all over the place. We need to wind up a bit, so. uh, But the, 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 the huge problem I have with, with the notion of job creation is that most of what we do already is a total and utter waste of time. Okay, thank you very much. And apologies to anyone else who wanted to make a point or ask a question, but I think we've come to the end of our time. So I'd like to ask the three panellists to give a final summing up and, if possible, to address some of those points that have been raised. Cost us first. I will, yeah, I will be very quick. I think that in the coming years, um, labor movements, intellectuals, and others uh, in, will face three, three major problems in Europe, and we've got to be clear about them. There'll be a problem of debt, first of all. You've got to be clear about it. The problem of public debt uh, is going to be with us. It's just started to emerge. The awareness of it in Europe is very low, but they, that's going to be a major problem in the coming years, default on the debt. Right? Dealing with it and defaulting on it. That's going to be with us. And you've got to realize, default on the debt is an anti-capitalist thing because it challenges property rights. It basically says to the, to the creditor, you're not going to get your money back. Right? And, and you're not going to get your, credit, your money back because I say so. So, so that, if you're asking me what is anti-capitalist, that's anti-capitalist. Right? And of course, it can happen in many different ways. And that's for us to decide and to, and to work out. So debt is going to be with us. And that's the first thing. Second thing that's going to be with us is inequality. Inequality has become gigantic, and the effects of it are beginning to be felt across Europe, and dealing with it is going to be a major issue. It's already, it already is a major issue. Major issues will be, it will become even bigger, and that, of course, ties in with tax, the point that was um, made previously, because tax uh, has been a key way in which inequality has increased, the, uh, rescuing the rich from paying tax, basically. So if we want to do something about inequality, we've got to do many things, but one thing we've got to do is reform, restructure the tax system, we have redistribution of income and wealth uh, in this way that's going to be with us. Third thing that's going to be with us is, of course, unemployment. Unemployment is very, very serious. Unemployment is of paramount importance because employment is what defines workers. You cut workers off from employment, they become a mass, they become nothing. Right? If you cut them off from the norms, the habits, and the systems of work, they become nothing. Right? So the, the, the paramount task for people who think about alternative organization of society is to protect employment. Job creation is of great importance 
in, in everything we've got to do. So these three areas uh, will be with us in the coming years. We've got to devise alternative ways uh, of handling them and, and of responding to them. What's the vision in doing that? The vision would be to propose ways of dealing with this while shifting the balance of, of, of power against capital and in favor of labor. That's really what the, the, the near-term vision should be. Shift the balance in favor of labor. Change the balance in society in favor of, la of labor. And of course, that's why exiting the Eurozone and defaulting on the debt is a key way of doing that. If it's done the way in which I described it or, 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 in, or in similar ways. Shift the balance uh, uh, against capital in favor of labor for the first time in three decades. The opportunity is right in front of us. Can we do it? I don't, I'm not terribly heartened. The reason is the left has been terribly battered the last two, three decades. It's been battered organizationally and it's been battered, battered uh, intellectually and in terms of ideas and concepts. Where is the confidence? I observe this audience and I have the similar audiences. Where is the fire? Where is the confidence? Where are the ideas? Where, where is the challenge? Where is the, where is the, the desire to take on uh, the capitalist world and do something about it? I don't see it. And where is the awareness of the problems that we've got in front of us? It doesn't exist as powerfully as one would like to see. Therefore, the task we've got in front of us, unfortunately, and that's for those who, among us who are hot-headed, the task we've got in front of us is one of rebuilding, rebuilding the confidence uh, of the movement and of the left, being, becoming capable of answering the real problems of society, not the problems of the amphitheater, not the problems of the small group in the pub where I can win the argument against you and I can have 15 people while you've got 12. Right? That's not the issue. The issue is to be able to put across uh, ideas, proposals, uh, measures, and uh, inspired by a vision that can persuade large numbers of people. We're not there yet, and we've just started the, 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 the rebuilding of this uh, capacity to do so. Thanks, Costa. George, what would you like to say as your two minutes? Yes, I'd like to follow very briefly on one or two of the things that uh, Costas has said and one or two of the things mentioned by members of the audience. I think the point about defence of the welfare state was extremely important. I think the whole notion that in the post-war period, the working class, both in Britain and on the continent, throughout continental Europe, won a post-war settlement, which is now being dismantled, is absolutely central to any political project, including this political project. And I'd say, Costas, perhaps one of the ways we need to shift our thinking is focusing a bit more on that, right? Let me take up a point about Larry Elliott tax strike and all that. The problem is not so much about taxes. The problem increasingly is about the rich not paying their taxes. I don't know how many of you follow a chap named Richard Murphy, who's an excellent blogger. On he, He's one of the founders of the Tax Justice Network. Take Britain. How many, how many have you, have you have seen those posters which talk about scroungers, people who hang around and live off welfare and whatever. The Treasury estimates that we lose perhaps one billion pounds a year from welfare scrounging at a maximum, okay? What we lose from tax evasion and avoidance, an official estimate, is up to 70 billion pounds a year. So, if you want to talk about redistribution, you have to start about talking, you have to talk about really enforcing the tax system we already have, as well as making it more progressive. I've written various things for Compass about that, but that's another story. We do have one good thing at the moment coming out of the meeting in Brussels, and that's the acceptance of the FTT the financial transactions tax, at even the limited version of the financial tra transactions tax accepted by the Eurozone, which excludes forex transactions, even that limited version would be worth 
would raise the European budget by about 50, 40 to 50%. It's worth about 60 billion euros per annum. Uh, final point about trade unions, resistance, and that kind of thing. And this ties into all the points made about socialism or its absence. My point was really about the institutional foundations of ideology. Why is it that there are not more people on the ground and in the marches who are fighting for, to defend the welfare state and to pres you know, why is it that we have the most reactionary government that I can recall in my lifetime? People like Osborne and, you know, Cameron, who are the very... <laughs> they, they represent the ruling class. What better representation could you have of, of the kind of naked arrogance of power? Well, part of the reason you have it is because there are not the institutions there to fight against it. Uh, we used to have something like 40% of people employed in industry in this country, and many of those were trade unionists. Today, only 15% of the workforce is in industry. Uh, the rate of, tr of trade unionization in Britain is miserable. Let me leave you with one final thought. If you go to the Nordic countries, you find that between 90 and 95% of the population belongs to a trade union. Whereas in Britain, I think the comparable figure is 18%. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's a bit higher than that, but anyway. Well, the point 20, is well made. between 18 and 25. Well, one of the great successes in the Nordic countries in the 1960s and 70s when they had hegemony was to hand the whole pension system to the trade unions to administer, not to the city as under Thatcher, but to the trade unions. So if you want a pension, and in the Nordic countries you get genuine pensions, real ones, right? You belong to a trade union, and that's what, one of the things that keeps the system together. I shan't go, I mean, there have been a lot of points raised. I'd love to go into them in more detail, uh, but Costas That's... has covered much of that already. Thank you, George. Um, Staffis, could you wind up, conclude, and tie up all the loose ends in two minutes? Of course, of course, of course. It's very, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, We have to be lucid, I think, first of all, about the level of resistance. I think that if we, I mean, compare the, the, the level of the attacks, their gravity, and the level of resistance uh, throughout Europe, I don't think that the image is particularly positive, first point. Okay? Greece is a specific case because the gravity of uh, the Greek crisis is just incomparable with, with, with the rest. And even in Greece, despite the very high level of resistance and actually an ongoing popular upheaval, this is what exactly is happening, uh, thinking in terms of political alternative is, is, is very, very difficult actually because there are all kinds of uh, reasons blocking things on, 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 on the left uh, about which you know, I spoke previously uh, very briefly. The second thing is that uh, by themselves, resistances do not provide okay, the, the, the solutions. I mean, even at a quite significant level, they made uh, very well end up in, in being defeated. Uh, this, uh, just to give you a recent example, France, for instance, has been characterized in, in a full decade between 95 and 2006, uh, broadly speaking, by a very high level of resistance to neoliberal projects. And some of those mobilizations were partly successful in 95 and 2006, for instance. Uh, however, the final outcome of this was Sarkozy, by far the most neoliberal uh, president of the post-war period uh, being elected in 2007. So the political terrain is, of course, of paramount importance. Uh, last uh, reflection on, on this. We really have to think about the lessons of the Argentinian uh, experience, especially from uh, the standpoint of, of Greece, for two reasons. The first is that I think that the, the deepest reason why uh, no one comparable, or even remotely, to a Kirchner has appeared or might appear in the foreseeable future in Greece is the fact that 
Greece is different from Argentina in that it's not a country in the periphery of the world uh, system. It's not a kind of national or even regional crisis. It's a small country, yes, but which is part of you know, the, the, the very center, actually, of, of the advanced capitalist countries, of, of the core uh, capitalist countries, which means that the Greek ruling class and the Greek political elite are organically linked to the ruling classes and uh, to the capitalist project of the European Union. So uh, uh, you see the level of confrontation is at a very different level. This is what prevents, I think, in a much deeper way, a Greek Kirchner to appear. The second lesson from the Argentinian experience is that you can have a um, relatively spontaneous uh, popular movement uh, as successful as uh, kicking uh, out uh, a president of, of uh, an elected president uh, out of office. Uh, however, if you don't have uh, an alternative, uh, uh, you end up by at the very best, uh, and the Argentinian solution is not the worst thing that might happen, okay? You, but you end up certainly by having someone from within the system which just accepts a kind of minimal level of compromise to get out of the situation. The final lesson of the Argentinian experience is uh, that uh, uh, the left-wing forces, which did exist and do exist actually even now in uh, Argentina, have been completely overwhelmed by the very forms and the very ways popular protest and popular movements uh, occurred. Uh, and this is something we are witnessing now, I mean, actually. What, what is happening is that uh, we are realizing that, you know, a whole series of social sectors uh, are organizing or acting in ways that are completely different from the traditional ways of the workers' movement and the traditional ways to which the, the, the left is, is, is used to. And this poses all kinds of new organizational issues. This poses new kind of intellectual issues. And uh, we really have to uh, work on that, to reflect seriously on that, to reflect strategically on all these issues. And uh, the time is pressing. <coughs> Thanks very much, Stavis. That brings us to the end of the meeting. I'd like to thank Costas, George, Stathis, and Paul Mason in his absence, and thank you to all of you for coming and participating in such a successful meeting. Thank you very much. Chinese style, everyone applauds. <laughs>